Thank you, Bill, for agreeing to talk to us and to contribute to the Oral History Project. If I can begin by asking you how long and where you have lived in Marlborough. Well, I've lived in Marlborough, as you might say, all my life. That's 82 years. I was born in Marlborough at a place called High Walls, which is now demolished. And they were demolished in 1932. It was a row of cottages in the front of St Mary's Church. And the postal code is um, New Road. But the cottages were known as High Walls. As I said, they were demolished in 1932. The reason was to widen the road. And because there was obviously getting more traffic at the time. And uh, for, well, they said slum clearance, but I cannot make why it was slum clearance because there were pretty decent houses along there. Were they very big houses? How many bedrooms? Well, it was three, sto- three floors, but I was thinking about four bedrooms and a sitting room and a kitchen and a parlour. You know, quite an old, old house. Of course, there were no bathrooms. And, uh, of course, I mean, in those days, they used the old wash hand basins. Cold water, if they wanted hot water, they had to do it with a kettle. I can remember my uncle coming home from work, and he worked on the railway, and he'd walk straight through the house, and at the back of the house, outside, was a a huge sink. And he used to turn the tap on, and the cold water, and he used to strip to the waist, washing cold water, and I can remember that quite vividly. I don't know if I said, but this was my grandma's house, Mm -hmm. and um, I spent some wonderful times there as a youngster. Some of the memories I can remember Christmas time, looking across the road, butcher shop opposite, at the Christmas display that they had there. And just along the road a bit was Mr. Mitchell's. He had a, a shop, and it used to sell all sorts of things like china, um, clothes baskets, pots, pans and whatnot. And I can still remember the smell from that shop of paraffin, because he used to sell paraffin. And you can always remember that smell as you went by there, or when I used to stand at the door of my grandma's house, always smelled paraffin. But I don't know, it seemed to be a, a lovely smell, because I suppose in those days we used a lot of paraffin with oil lamps, paraffin lamps. And of course, when you went into a house and saw a paraffin lamp, I don't know, it sort of gave you that feeling of comfort. Paraffin lamp and the old fire, you know, you don't get the fires now. I mean, the centre the center point nowadays is a television. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You talked about the washing arrangements, but what about the sanitary arrangements? Uh, sanitary arrangements, well, outside toilets. Yeah. Would that have been in the churchyard virtually? Or? Well, more or less in the front of the churchyard, <laughs> yes. Because yeah. I always tell people I was born in the churchyard, because if you look there now, I mean, there's no houses there, and you can just see the church, see the uh, churchyard. So you lived there with your grandmother, and who else was in the house with you? Well, we weren't living near them, but my mum went there to help me, Ah, to have a confinement, to went my grandma's house. Uh And uh, from there we moved to um, number one Barn Street, Mm -hmm. and uh, we lived there until I was 11 years old. And then we moved up to the new housing estate, Isby Road. I think we were one of the first tenants there, Isby Road. Of course, at that time, at the back of there was all fields. Isby Road was there before Cherry Orchard was built. Oh, yes, yeah. Cherry Orchard was built right after Isby Road and all those other places up there was Cherry Orchard, Lower Is- Upper Isbury. So what was there before Field. Cherry Orchard? Just, fields. Just, just fields. Just fields, yes. And it must have been quite a slope. So was it for just grazing? Yeah. The council used to bring their two horses up there to graze. Then, I don't know when it was actually done, but we had the bowling green right at the very top, or facing out towards the forest. That was the first bowling green in Marlborough there. Just to sort of go back a step, you were one of how many children? Twelve. Twelve. I had a sister, a stepsister older than me, and um, I was the eldest boy. Mum lost three children as babies when they were about a month old, I think they were. And um, there are five of us surviving now, so... 
So how many of you lived in the house at one time? What's the most? Uh, the most that would have been there? Yeah. Let's say I would say, I would think there could have been, at least, could, could have been ten, ten there, nine or ten. Yeah. yeah. Well, five, yeah, I, I think that might have been stretching it a bit, say eight, eight there at one yeah. time. I can remember five of us boys slept in one bedroom and three of us slept in one bed and two in another bed. I can remember that. Things and of course, changed. the girls, they had their room. Yeah, there were two girls, actually. No, three. Yeah, two girls. Yeah. And did you say you were the eldest? I was the eldest boy. Yeah. 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 And what's what's the difference between the eldest, yourself, and and your youngest sibling? Is it? Well, um, I suppose when my the last sister was born, I would have been 21. Mm. And the youngest, well, I was the eldest at 21 and then that was during the war where young sister was born so I can remember coming home on leave actually I was married and my wife had just had our daughter and I visited my mum in Severnack Hospital and she cried because she said I'm sorry she said that I've had another baby she said and to think I'm a grandma now she said and I had another baby I said mum I said as long as you're okay that's all that matters Mm -hmm. People that, don't think twice about that nowadays, no. do they? And that was when they had the uh, maternity unit in Savannah Hospital. Mm. And, of course, you're only got to mention the name, Dr. Tim Morris. He was the one that delivered most of the babies. Absolutely. And that babe that was born was Hazel. And they found after about six months that she had a... There's something wrong with her heart. And they said that she would live until she was 11 years old. It's what we called a blue baby. And she did. She lived until she was 11 years old. It was the love and care of my mum and dad and the family that sort of kept her going. And she was a perfect kid. She passed the grammar school exam. She went to the grammar school. And I can remember my mum, when she first went to the grammar school, my mum pushed her there, 11 years old, in a pushchair. Because it was too far for her to walk with her heart trouble. Now, had she been alive this day and age, she would have been operated on and she'd have been okay. Could you think back and sort of think to what your earliest memory would be? I think the memories that stand out most is the thing that doesn't happen today much. On a Sunday, you had your best clothes on. You always had your best clothes on on a Sunday. And we'd go for a walk in the evening, mum and dad, and maybe I don't know how many of us were, probably a tribe of kids. And we'd walk along Tricklebolly and along out to Martin, to the pub at Martin. And my dad would have his pint and we kids would be outside with their packet of crisps mm. and a lemonade. And that doesn't happen these days. Mm. And I mean, that was a thing that I look forward to. You've retired now, but um, yes. perhaps you could take us through the places you've worked in the town, who they were run by, where they were and, um, and what it was like. Well, when I left school, my first job was at the headmaster's house or the college. I'd always wanted to go into private service. I wanted to be a butler. And uh, I had to work under the under a parlour maid there. And believe you me, she was very, very strict. And I didn't stick that long. I only, only did it. For, it was with uh, Mr. Turner. He was the headmaster then. I stuck it for about six months. And then I got a job with uh, Hilliers the Builders. An apprenticeship of um, painting and decorating. Mm-hmm. Did you do some sign writing as well? I didn't, no, because I didn't, actually, I left there before I completed my apprenticeship to join the RAF. I joined the RAF in, when I was 19. I had another couple of years apprenticeship to do. And, of course, that all went down the pan. I never even did any sign writing. So what, what age are we talking about here? When, when did you leave school? I left school at 14. At 14. Yeah. And then, and then I, I went to, um, I suppose I was about 14 and a half when I went to Hilliers. And uh, I suppose I worked in most places in the high street. You know, the hotels, Ellsby Arms, Castle and Ball, Painting and uh, decorating. Ivy House. Yeah. So you left school at around 14. You probably started at Hilliers at around, what? Well, I'd say 15. Yeah, and then... You went into the RAF, I think you said, when in 1940? Yeah, I was, nine, yeah, I was 19, 1940. And how long yeah. were you in the RAF for? 
uh, six years. As yeah. a, I was an armor. I was working on um, spits, fires, and hurricanes. My first squadron was the um, American Eagle Squadron. They were volunteers, American chaps. They came over and joined the RAF, and they formed two squadrons, actually, in this country. And the one I was with was 71st Eagle Squadron. That was the leading one. And we um, used to do escort jobs, airplanes. And I was uh, an armor, you know, responsible for the guns on the planes and, you know, making sure that they were harmonized properly and all firing all. I never had any problems, I must say. I was very lucky, really. Of course, when the Americans came into the war, we had to disband them, their squadrons, and they had to transfer over to the 8th Army Air Corps. And then from there, I was on loan then from the RAF to the Fleet Air Arm. And I'd done my rest of my time with the Fleet Air Arm. And uh, I used to have to service the sea fires. They used to fly them off the carriers. And I was at, near Yeovil. And they used to fly them off the carriers. And I was a corporal then. And I had about, I suppose, about two dozen Royal Naval Air, Air Station chaps and a couple of wrens. And I had to sort of supervise the, um, when they came in for service. It was quite a good time, really. So when did you leave the RAF? In uh, 1946, yeah. And did you go back to painting and decorating? Uh, yes. I, when I came out of the... I went back and I got a job with Tom Menty for, I don't know, a couple of years, I suppose. And then I went with uh, Mr Eustace, the builder. I got. I was foreman painter there for all the time. Uh, Minty had a yard at Alcott Lane. Yeah. Eustace had a, a yard down by um, Freeze Yard, I think we called it. Mm. They had a yard down there. And how long did you work for Eustace for? Ten years, I would think. Yeah. Then I, I f- finished with him. That was when I went to the Merlin for Mr. and Mrs. Paulson. And the Merlin was, was a hotel and a restaurant, and they also had a snack bar there. And I went there to manage the snack bar, and we had a sort of a gaming room with the pin tables and a jukebox. And I was there, I suppose, for, I can't remember exactly, but I think there's about nine years there. Of course, that was before the motorway, and we used to have quite a lot of through traffic and uh, met quite a lot of celebrities in there. Really? So yeah. Like oh, who? yeah. A lot of the uh, the pop groups and whatnot, and the um, old Jackie Palo and all his wrestling friends. Uh, Henry Cooper and his manager, um, Jim Wicks. I've got actually, I've got a picture of Jackie Pollo, um, and also I've got a picture of Henry Cooper, which is pretty rare, I would imagine, because it's uh, with his three Lansdale belts, which I believe he sold now because I think he wanted to raise some money. Mm. And uh, we've had one or two film stars in. Um, so you enjoyed yeah. yourself then? Oh yeah, it was okay, but unfortunately we had this hooligan element with the football supporters and of course they used to come in and try and wreck the place. Actually it made me ill. Was and, it when uh, certain teams met or was it Yeah, the it was time? Uh, mostly Bristol Rovers and Millwall. If yeah. they met in, in Marlborough, that was, that was it. It was just kids, 12, 13 year old, that were causing all the trouble. It just bravado, I suppose. I can remember one lad get John Neal, local lad. They were beating him up in the uh, in the snack bar. I walked through and they just scattered. Anyway, um, I became ill. It was getting me down actually. So I went saw Doctor Bob, and Doctor Bob said to me, "Bob, where this is?" He said, "Mr. Cox," he said, "you've got to pack that job in." He said, "No," he said, "otherwise you'll be up six foot under up the common, he meant that, you know, it would be the mm. death of me, so I did, I just packed it in. And I applied for a job then at the post office, and I got a job straight away there. Was that locally, or was that... Uh, yeah, in Marlborough, in yeah, Marlborough, yeah. I started off on um, rural delivery, and then I, after a while, I um, went into the um, office, into the registered locker, as a postman or a grade. We had a little bit of problems with um, one of my wife's sisters, who lived in... Essex, and uh, she was always on my back on the phone, couldn't cope because she just lost her husband. And uh, she said, I'm having my place 
having a flat put on, she said, wondered if you'd like to move up. And like a fool, I agreed. But it didn't work out. Because mm. I was only up there about, 12, well, about, about a month, and I was taken ill. And that was when I had an operation and lost the biggest part of one lung. So how long anyway, were, you, were you out of Marlborough for then, was it? Pardon? How long were you out of Marlborough for, was it? 14 years. 14 we were up there 14 years, yeah. That must have come quite hard for a Marlborough boy. I was 59 when I moved up there. Yeah. And um, when I became 60, the post office said, that's it, because of this, you know, this lung trouble. So I had to retire at 60. And, of course, I was looking for another job. And I eventually got another job in London with a security firm. For nine years, I did the security at the head office of Mercantile Credit Company yeah. in Holborn. I went on then to, I was with the, uh, did security work at the Bank of Ireland as well, oh. head office of the Bank yeah. of Ireland. Uh-huh. You talked yeah. about when you were a painter and decorator. Do you have any stories about uh, your days painting and decorating and anything yeah, you might I think, have found um, along the way? I think an interesting thing is where the Merchant House is now. I forget who was trading there at the time, but myself and Mr. Oram, that was the chap that was taking me from my apprenticeship, we were doing some decorating there. And it was right at the top of the building, and we had to sort of clean the walls off, and we came across one wall that was done with the old hurdles and Watland up, which uh, just showed you the age of the building. And that hadn't been seen for well, years. Well, years think. and years. No, yeah. of course not, no. Now, taking a step back, where did you go to school and, and what was it like? Well, I went to school at St Peter's. Well, St Mary's, first of all. And this would have been where? That's uh, Heard Street, till I was seven years old. And then from there, when I was seven, down to St Peter's School, in the end of the High Street. That's where the library is now? That's where the library is now, yes. Yeah. I left there when I was 14. Yeah, I was there from 1928 to 1935, and we didn't have any uniform, but um, it was very strict, and we showed respect for the teachers, yeah. believe you me, because one thing, it was discipline. We had the fear of the cane. Bill Bartram was our headmaster. One thing we didn't have a lot of there was sport. I think we had one afternoon a week, and we used to have to go out line up to the common and probably have a couple of overs of cricket and then that was it, half an hour and that was our sport. So yeah. the school as it was then looked very different on the inside oh, much, to what the library looks like Oh today. good, the old coke stove in the middle of the classroom. Oh Bill Bartram, our headmaster, when we used to go into his class, because you changed classes in those yeah. days, yeah. you know, one to take history, one to take science and Mr Bartram was to, his was geography. Uh-huh. And uh, of course when we used to go in, we always used to try and get at the back and of course at the back in the classroom was nearer St Peter's Church and he always used to sort of sort you out and he'd say right come and sit on the front and remember this he said nearer to church further from God that was an old saying of his when you weren't at school do you have any other childhood memories of things you used to do oh well I was in the Boy Scouts I well, in the Cubs and later on in the Boy Scouts I had a spell in the Boys Brigade too which I rather enjoyed. And you talked about not taking up any sport at school because of the lack of facilities, so to That's speak. That's right. But you were into boxing, I understand. The field above Isbury Road, I said before, the bowling green was there, and of course they had a barbed wire fence. And I think we had enough rope to do three sides of the ring. So one side of the ring was a barbed wire fence. <laughs> I can remember Freddie Chessel and I were having a scrap. It was all in good fun. There was no on a musty bunks, and uh, he knocked me and I caught my eye against the barbed wire and I've still got the scar now. Oh yeah, somebody remarked on it only just the other day, you still got that scar from the boxing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we used to spend a lot of time in the forest and uh, Pantowick. Well, Pantowick? Where, Pantowick, Where's, where's yeah. Pantowick? Over where the tunnel was, where the trains used to go through to Savernac. And that was just all fields and mm-hmm. mushrooms and rabbits and we used to set wires to catch the rabbits and that was what we used to pass time away. Yeah, not many people will know that particular name nowadays. No, Pantowick, no they wouldn't. No, a lot yeah. of the old people would, you yeah. know, like uh, old George Duck and Dick Milsom and people like that, they'd know Pantowick. And are there any particular incidents that you remember as a child? Coming home from school, 
I was often delayed going down Angel Yard. That was where they had the slaughterhouses in those days. And I think you'll find that in one of the Marlborough books, they've got a picture of it where they were burning the bristles off the pigs. And actually, I've got an uncle standing there that worked at the slaughterhouses, Arthur Douglas. The slaughterhouse, would that have just been for one butcher or for all the butchers? Oh, there'll be uh, one, two, three butchers down there. Yeah, it'd be Coopers, Webbers and Serling Bernard. Uh, no, I beg your pardon, not Weber's, because Weber used to do his slaughtering in New Road. That was when one day, I can remember, one of the, is either a bullock or a heifer or something, got loose and they run out into, the, into a yard. It was enclosed, but nobody could get near it, so they got a, a marksman from the army, from one of the camps out on the plain. And I can remember seeing him standing up on high walls with a rifle, and he, bang, shot it. Remember that. Getting on to cows again, I can remember when I was decorating down in the parade, Fred Haraway had a shop there. I was knelt down painting the sill of the front window. Next door was a Hilliers. They had a footer's shop, frog forest and whatnot. And um, all of a sudden there was a bit of a commotion and I looked round and saw this bullock or whatever it was coming across the parade, straight in through the shop door. And the next thing I saw was the pew. It was flying through the window, came out through the window. I suppose it saw its reflection in the window or, or saw the outside, didn't realise obviously that it was glass. So talk about pulling a china shop, it was pulling a fruit shop, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. Yeah. Now, did you do errands for parents and grandparents? Oh, yes. The, um, yeah, I used to, um, down at Sandy Birchall's, the grocer's down in the Pride, I used to do my mum's shopping on a Friday night for her and uh, take a ten bob note and that would get all the shopping you wanted. My grandma, I think the shopping I did for her was um, going across to the Bear and Castle across the road on the corner of the Pride with a, a jug and getting her a quarter bitter and a packet of fags, a packet of stars and I used to take it back over to her and she used to have a plate there with a nice piece of seed cake. People will remember seed cake in my days. And I hated it. <laughs> I always had to eat it, though. Getting back, I used to have to go up to the railway station and get the papers off the train at quarter past five. That was the uh, train that left London, I suppose, about half two, something like that. And then it changed its sovereign out. They threw the papers off, and then they brought them through to Marlborough. It was about a dozen... Evening Standards, and a dozen Evening News. We had two chaps, used to take them round, mostly to the pubs. Papers those days were only, what, a penny each, I suppose, something like that. And then when they delivered, come back to my grand's about, I suppose, about half past six, seven o'clock, put the coppers on the table. That was when grand used to sort out a few coppers, about eight pence, nine pence, ten pence, or whatever. That paid for a quarter bitter and a packet of stars. Now, in your profession as a painter and decorator, you said that you worked in most of the buildings in the High Street, and we've all seen photos of the exterior of the High Street cinema, but uh, can you describe what it was like once you went through those arched doors at the front? Yeah, well, my earliest memories of that was, well, before, because it was refurbished some years ago, and my earliest memories, you went in and you went down steps, and the box office where you paid your Tuppence or threepence, which it cost you in those days. I'm talking about 1929, 1930, you know, I was about seven or eight years old. You just go through swing doors, and uh, it was what we used to call a flea pit, because you always used to come out of there with a flea. It was pretty rough, it, you know, before they refurbished it. It was silent films. A chap called Lewis used to play the piano. Was that his first name, or was it Mr. Lewis? Mr. Lewis, yeah. yeah. And uh, you'd sit there and you'd suddenly feel something going over your feet. And it would be a rat or a mouse from the uh, stables at the back where Freeze, the coal merchants, kept their horses. Then, of course, later on, they had it refurbished. And then it was a posh affair then. You just went straight in then and you didn't go down any steps or anything. The box office was, as you went in, straight in front of you. And then you had a balcony that went upstairs off the box office. That car, I don't know what it cost, about three bob, something like that. And then you go in, and then you go into the main hall of the cinema, and uh, I think you'd have sort of about four different prices of seats. 
And I think the cheapest was seven pence. Then it went up to about one and nine, and then two and something. It was lovely, plush, red tip-up seats. Decor was really good. But the lady that owned the cinema was Miss Ada Hillier. She was a sister of Hillier the Builders. And um, the operator that used to do the operating in the cinema was an employee of Hillier's. He was a painter, actually, same as me. And they asked me one day if I'd like to pop along. And that was when I was about 16, I suppose. And help out, do a bit of ushering. Also, going up into the uh, operating, don't know what they called it, operating room, I suppose. Projection room? Projection room, that's it. That's the word. The projection room. And, of course, they had two projectors. They put reels. There were big reels that they had to put in, you know, for the films. And, uh, of course, when one reel was coming to an end... The next one was switched on, and then you take that reel off, and that had to be rewound, ready for the next day, or if it was going on to another cinema. And the chap that was the operator was Wally Bray. I can always remember Wally, when I used to be up in the projection room, he used to say to me, I'm just going to slip along to the Jolly Butcher for a pint. And of course he left me to it, and of course I was green, I didn't know much about what was going on. And of course all of a sudden it would break down, wouldn't it? Then of course it would be boo, boo, you know, from down below, and everybody was shouting. Then I had to make a mad dash along to the Jolly Butcher and say, Wally, for God's sake, come along, it's all broken down. That cinema was a good thing during the war too, because, as you know, we had a lot of troops stationed around while we were in the forest and bulleted in the town. And that used to be an absolutely chocker block on a Sunday evening. And you talked about the projection room. Where was the projection room? That was room? up above the a balcony, like at the top. How did you up, get to that then? Upstairs. Yeah. And then you go on more stairs up. When you looked out, you could see the screen and the light, you know, that was showing the film. And it was just a haze of smoke in those days because everybody smoked. So you didn't need to buy your own cigarettes, Pardon? you could smoke everybody else's yeah, by you the time had, it yeah, rose up of, to your level. Plenty of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> now you talked about the Jolly Butcher, are there any other pubs that are no longer oh, with us today that you remember from Oh history? yeah, well there's the um, Bell and Shoulder. Whereabouts was that? In Kingsbury Street, just up above the Cancer Research Shop. That was a nice little pub, nice little local. Used to go in there quite a bit and... The Duke of York, that was in St Martin's. There are uh, council buildings there now called York Place. That was a good little pub. I Actually, I worked in one of the pubs in the um, Royal Oak during the war in 1939. I serving behind the bar. That was with Mr Shergold. I used to do the waiting in the lounge bar. And this chap that was training me, Bill Isles was his name, I can remember his name. He used to say to me, Buster, of course I was always known as Buster, not Bill. When you take the chains to them, he said, make sure that the tray is swimming in beer. He said, because they'll say, so keep chains. That was a good old... No. <laughs> little trick of the trade. Yeah, little there. trick of the trade. <laughs> <laughs> now, I see in front of you, you've got an old directory of Marlborough, which has lots of old yes. names of businesses yeah. that have long since gone. Yeah. Just wondered whether you had any particular memories of any of them that you can see in front of you. Yeah, well, as I was just saying, I bought my first cycle at H Ducks in the High Street. I had two or three jobs, and I had to pay for the bike myself. It was pound twenty-five actually. I can remember Mr Duck, he used to keep all his cycles down in the cellar. And he said, I've got a nice bike here for you, second hand, Ellswick Sports. I think it was pound twenty-five, And I think I paid him half a crown a week <laughs> until I paid for it, and then I got the bike. <laughs> Tommy Hart, the proud. That was um, a good baker shop. Got a good lardy cake there. And number four, so that yeah. would have been Rainbow. No, there's um, no below the Rainbow. There's um. Oh, the, I know the Pagoda. That's right. It's a restaurant. You can right, still yeah. see the oven on, yeah. on one of the back walls. Our church where we used to get a good haircut in Marlborough. Yeah, that's where the Italian yeah. shop is now, isn't it? Poly two rooms, which is still going. It's still there. Yeah. In those days, it was run by two ladies, uh-huh. Miss Leith Hay. And Miss McLeod. Jack Smith yeah. used to be along the London Road. That's Gerald's farm. Gerald's now got the business in the yeah. High Street. Yeah. The Ellsbury Arms Hotel, telephone number, number one. <laughs> now, I imagine the appearance and size of Marlborough has changed considerably over the years. Can you tell us 
what areas of the town have been developed in your lifetime and what was there before. You did mention previously about the area above Is- Isby Road where yes, Cherry yeah, Orchard's yeah. housing estate is yeah. now, but can you remember yeah. any other areas? Well, just to mention a few, uh, there was a big development where the gas works used to be in London Road. And that is now retirement homes. And if you go further on round from these retirement homes, there's another development there which was fields which go almost up from London Road up to um, St Martin's. Have you ever been round there? They call it Kellam Gardens, don't they? Yeah, Kellam Gardens. But that, that was all fields. Were the fields worked? No, I think it was just used for grazing. Yes. And uh, another one is, um, well, the St Margaret's Mead. That was a big estate. I mean, that... Uh, That's been that developed was, in uh, your lifetime? Since, yeah, oh, yeah, since the war. And what was there oh, yeah. before? Well, that was just fields. I mean, you've got um, St Margaret's Mead. You've got Five Stars Road. I mean, Five Stars Road. I remember why that was called Five Stars Road. Because there was a, a pathway that led from London Road up to the forest. And there were, you had to go over five stars to get to it. And you crossed over a bridge before you got to the forest, which went over the old railway line, would be Swindon to uh, Sovernack railway line, or from Cheltenham. The trains used to come through there to Southampton. And this path through St Margaret's Mead, would that be the path that now goes up the side of where the garage is in London Road? That's right. Yeah. That would be it. Yeah. That's, that's the old... And five... it goes up through Queensway, isn't that's it? That's right. That's the old Five Stars Road. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I can remember that it, there was a piggery there at one time. And then there's another, where I live now, that's um, Sovereign Court. That's off Salisbury Road. That was originally, it's a cattle yard. If you went further on, right through, that would take you right through to Five Stars. And that would just be fields right the way through. And in the cattle yard, Hooper and Pinnegar, they used to hold cattle sales there. I can remember that. Mm. And then River Park. That was another development off Pusey Road. I'm trying to think of the name of the flats in River Park that were built on the site of the old college laundry. Uh, it's called Castle Court now. Castle isn't it? Court. Mm-hmm. And from Cowbridge along as far as Figgins Lane, that was allotments. Yeah, as far as I know, they were council allotments. Yes. I got an idea Scurries was fields then, where Scurries Car mm. Park is. Because I'll bring you down to the bottom of Figgins Lane. Of course, the surgery and all that's been developed since then. And Scurries. And of course, then you've got Portfields. That was all allotments. There was also a tip up there, I believe, Pardon? at one time. There was a, there was a, r- they, a rubbish tip up there. That's right. They had a, the rubbish tip down below there, yeah. yeah. Where Rogers Meadow is, roughly Rogers now. Meadow, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. That's uh, all new houses, private and council. What about Laney's Close? Was Laney's Close always there in your life? Uh, yes, as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah Laney's Close, yeah. I remember a lady called Mrs Yockney. I know she's considerably yeah, older yeah, than you, oh, but yeah. she said that she remembered when La- even Laney's Close was just fields. So, That's right, yes. So really the town has expanded from, oh, it, from, from its centre and From and about outwards. the 30s onwards, that yeah. expanded tremendously. It's almost reached yeah. its boundaries now, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And um, Stony Bridge Close, that's another development along Alcott Lane, or as we say, down Stony Bridges. That was a nursery there for um, Hilliers, the fruiters and greengrocers. He had a nursery there. That was all fields. Dr. Morris owned the land there. And he, um, he used to have sort of chickens running there, ducks. And he used to take a walk up there every morning, Dr. Morris, the old Dr. Walter Morris. Mm. The founder of the firm. Yeah, founder of the firm. I I can remember being into a kid, one of the family, if one of the kids were ill, he'd come along at 8 o'clock in the morning on his walk and see how they were. And That was a good old days. Then, of course, further on, the school was built, St. John's School. Was that... Built on agricultural land? Yeah, it was agricultural land, yeah. yeah. And of course, that went right along to Granham Hill, you know, those mm. all those fields. Van Diemen's, that was all allotments, and of course, they got the infant school there. Now, you must remember the latter days of the town's railway stations. Yeah, yeah there, there's uh, another development. That's um, where the railway station's low-level station was. It's now Parsfield, another housing development. And uh, there were two stations in Marlborough. 
there was what they called the high level, which is up the top of Cherry Orchard, and the low level, which would have been just off the Sorcery Road. Well, where Tenet Council have got their yard now. Mm -hmm. The high level station was used mostly for things that need to be delivered in the town, and they had two vans that used to take the goods around the town and sort of around the different villages. And also the low level station, they used to load the horses from the stables. I can remember them walking in the horses from Martin Downs when I was a kid coming down Barn Street and from Ogborn, the stables at Ogborn, and they'd load them up on the station to Is take that... them to the races. Of course, I mean, they'd take them two or three days before they were going to run. Then, of course, that was all stopped because of the traffic on the roads, and then, of course, then the horse boxes came in. Do you remember any other livestock that coming in? Oh, yes, um, sheep from the sheep fairs on the common. They saw the sheep fairs on the common, and the shepherds used to drive the sheep after the sales up to the station. Yeah, we could um, used to wait for the shepherds driving the sheep down Hurd Street, and we knew very well that half the time they were drunk. And they relied on us kids to make sure the sheep didn't wander off along Silver Street or Herd Street or um, St Martin. So we used to stand sort of at the end of the roads and then sort of follow them up to the station. Were the shepherds and, in that much of a bad way then? Oh, yeah, they, they'd had a few drinks on the common because they always had a beer tent. And I suppose they all met together and then they had a good day out. Like. And then we used to finish up up the railway station, watch them load the sheep up. And then, if we were lucky, the shepherds would probably give us a penny each or something like that. And we were quite happy with that, because a penny in those days was quite a lot of money. And, of course, there were um, accommodation for the uh, signalman and uh, the station master, which was just off the Salisbury Road, on the bank. And uh, it was, there were quite a big semi-detached house. And, of course, there was a signal box. That was at the uh, lower railway. That was just off the main platform. I think they had, I think it was two signalmen that they had there. You used to do shifts. And you could walk from the low-level station up to the high-level station. There was a pathway going up. Oh, there's a thing I must mention, too. When the stations closed, the booking hall for the high-level station, there was a chap that, his name was Noah Trotman. And he was a ganger on the lines, you know, he used to see to the lines and that. They turned it into accommodation, and he lived there for some years, and they called it Noah's Ark. <laughs> a lot of people remember that, the old people in Moore, but of course that's all gone now. I think it's almost time that we called it a day, Bill. Yeah. yeah. So if I, for the moment, can say thank you very much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, it's been an yeah. absolute delight to talk to you, and hopefully we can pick up with the recording another day again soon. So. Yeah, certainly. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank look you. forward to it.